Hey, welcome back to the Law Shanty. Thanks for joining us again. Um, I was going to play some music in the background today to distract you from the fact that I don't have any hair anymore. Um, but I was talking about it with a colleague of mine who happens to be an intellectual property lawyer, and he said, you can't do that. You'll be violating the copyright laws of the United States of America. And I decided at that moment that lawyers are the most unfun people in the world and we can kill anybody's fun anytime, anywhere. And that's not what we're trying to do here on The Law Shane. We're not trying to kill your fun. Although every time I tell you something new, that's probably exactly what I do is kill your fun. We're going to cover a couple of things today that I hope don't kill your fun, but it's news and it's not COVID news. It's other news. So I want to talk a little bit about some changes we're starting to see as we slide into the new administration. You know that President Biden, um, you may not know this, but let me tell you, President Biden is the one, one of the most union-friendly presidents we've had maybe ever. He's a big proponent of unions. He likes unions. Um, he campaigned on this. It's not a big secret. It's not like he hit it. And now all of a sudden, boom, I like unions. Um, he thinks unions are important to the growth of the middle class, and he campaigned on that. Um, so with that being said, we're going to talk about everything but unions, right? <laughs> we're, but we are going to talk about some um, changes in the law that may be becoming, that, that we might view as a little more employer-friendly, at least one case that's a little more employer-friendly. And we're just going to skim across a couple of things before we get started. The first thing I want to get to is... Please keep in mind, if you haven't heard this already, that the House of Representatives did pass the Equality Act. What is the Equality Act, you ask? The Equality Act is a comprehensive um, anti-discrimination statute that would amend a bunch of the current anti-discrimination statutes to include sexual orientation and gender identity. Some of you are saying to me, Palazzolo, what do we need that for? Didn't the Supreme Court in the Bostic decision last year, take sexual orientation and gender identity, encompass them within the term sex under Title VII and say they were illegal. Yes, they did. The Equality Act does that same thing. It does it in housing, employment, public accommodations, but it's a broader statute than that. It's a more comprehensive um, anti-discrimination statute than the finding in Bostic Proponents of the statute um, think it's very, very important that they get these broader protections in place. Um, opponents of the statute often object to it on uh, religious grounds. They say it interferes with religious rights. That, um, but that that's it is what it is, and that's what we've got. Now, we're not going to get into detail on that because it's only past the House. It hasn't even been considered yet in the Senate, and there's lots of stuff that's got to happen before this becomes law. And when it does, then we'll talk about it in detail. But at least for right now, we're not going to. The second thing that we want to talk about today is a regulatory change that was set to take effect in March of this year, and that's the DOL's new regulations on independent contractor status. Um, these regulations were published in the Federal Register on January 7th, which means they would have taken effect on March 8th. The Biden administration has taken steps to at least delay that, if not stop it, by publishing a new proposed rule in the Federal Register that would back this stuff off until May 7th so they can consider the rule. Just so you know, the new rule revolves around who's an independent contractor and who's an employee uh, under the Fair Labor Standards Act. The new rule uses an economic realities test, which is nothing new. Courts have been using an economic realities test for years and years and years. Um, it's got what it's called, what it calls, what the rule calls two core factors to consider. Number one is the nature and degree of control over the work. Who controls it? The employer or the quote unquote worker? And does the worker have opportunity for profit or loss based on their own initiative or their investment in their own company? Now there's some other Factors they want you to look at, three other factors, but those are the two core factors. The other three factors are the amount of skill required for the work, the degree of permanence of the relationship. Are you going in and out if you're an independent contractor to different clients and so on and so forth? 
and whether the work is part of an integrated unit of production that is core to the employer, not the worker. Um, you know, are you in the business of writing code and that's what you're hiring the independent contractor to do to write code? Or do you make widgets and you've hired the independent contractor to write code and you see how those are two entirely different things. Now, again, uh, there's a, an effort to delay this and there was an opinion letter that was issued on this very same issue that the Biden administration has already withdrawn. They say they withdraw because the courts haven't followed it. They're not following it and they're not giving it deference. But that opinion letter has been withdrawn too. The last thing I want to talk about is a case that just came out of the Seventh Circuit um, last month was decided on February 3rd called White versus United Airlines. And it involves the Uniform Services Employment and Reemployment Rights Act and the issue of paid leave under that act. Okay, so let's start at the very beginning. USERA, which is the statute that if somebody goes and joins the military, they get rehire rights, but it also protects people who are in the reserve and the military and stuff like that. It said a person who's absent from employment by reason of service in the uniform services shall be entitled to, quote, such other rights and benefits as are generally provided by the employer to employees having similar seniority status and pay. Okay, that's section 4316 of the statute, all right? Rights and benefits elsewhere in the statute is defined to mean terms, conditions, or privileges of employment, including any advantage, profit, privilege, gain, status, account, or interest, open paren, including wages for salary or salary for work performed, close paren, that accrues by reason of an employment contract. And before you get all excited, at-will employment is a contract. It's just an at-will contract, all right? In addition to what's in the statute, the regulations provide that if a non-seniority benefit to which employees are entitled vary according to the type of leave that the employee is given, the employee must be given the most favorable treatment according to any comparable form of leave when he or she performs uniform services. So that means if I provide a benefit to one group of people, and then I go on, my employee goes on military leave. That employee is entitled to the best benefit that I provide to people who take comparable leaves. And that's going to be important in this case. What is a comparable leave? So in the case, Mr. White, who was a member of the Air Force Reserves, brought a, it might still be, I don't know, I said was, and I apologize for that, uh, brought a cause of action against United Airlines claiming that he was entitled to pay for his short-term training leaves while he was in the reserve. And he said that because United provided jury duty pay and sick leave pay for people who took short-term leave. And he also claimed that United counted that pay as wages for perfect purposes of United's profit-sharing plan. And unpaid leave wasn't counted as wages toward profit-sharing plan. Okay, so he's not only claiming I should have gotten paid for the leave, but I also should have gotten profit share credit, credit, and that probably added up to a fair amount of money. The original plaintiff um, had initiated a class action lawsuit alleging that the failure to provide paid leave and, and profit sharing um, on military leave denied them rights and benefits given for comparable non-military leave. The district court dismissed the lawsuit. White appealed. On appeal, the Seventh Circuit overturned the district court and held that as a matter of law, paid leave fell within the rights and benefits defined by USERA. Now, here's what it didn't decide. It didn't decide that jury duty leave and sick leave were comparable kinds of leave. It also didn't say they weren't. What it said was go back to the lower court and make a determination about whether those are comparable leave. So why is this important? It's important because we've got for the first time a court of appeals, we've had district courts say this sort of thing, hold that paid leave is a right or benefit under USERA and you've got to look at comparable forms of leave. Now, we may find out what a comparable form of leave is if this thing 
winds its way through the courts and gets back up to the Seventh Circuit again. But again, that's just the Seventh Circuit. Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin. I'm in Michigan, pals, so why you're telling me this. Well, if you have employees in Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, you need to pay attention to this um, particular lawsuit. But also, this lawsuit is kind of the end, if you will, of a trend. We've seen these sorts of lawsuits before, and now we've finally got a court of appeals opining on this. For example, um, just last year, Walmart entered into a $14 million settlement with a group of employees over the exact same issue, except it was Army Reserve instead of Air Force Reserve. And Walmart set aside $14 million plus, changed all their policies to reflect this. And in California, in the Northern District of California, I think right now, the court just certified a class with a different airline for the exact same purpose to decide this case. So we're moving in the direction of paid leave under USERA. Now, should you run out and change your policies right away today? Eh, no, probably not. But let's keep an eye on this and see where it goes. We may end up in front of the Supreme Court eventually on this decision. And we'll also have to keep an eye on it here in the Sixth Circuit. So that's what's new and exciting in the wonderful world of employment law today. Um, hope you're doing well. And I'll see you in a fortnight.